Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. This is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program. I'm based in Tucson and I'm the co-director of CCAST. CCAST launched a webinar series in April of this year, 2020. Our webinars are focusing primarily on control of non-native aquatic species in support of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice but we're also featuring um, aquatic species conservation and management case study presentations as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. Thanks, Matt. I'm Alex Caberly, and I'm a CCAS research specialist with the University of Arizona, and I'm based out of Tucson. And I'm also the coordinator of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Today, we have a webinar presentation on bullhead removal for native coastal rainbow trout conservation in Southern California. Uh, Russell's presenting, and Russell's a fisheries biologist for the Heritage and Wild Trout Program with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. As Matt mentioned, if you have any questions for Russell during the presentation, please feel free to enter them in the chat box. And afterwards, we'll have time for a question and answer session, and I'll relay those to our speaker. So now I'd like to turn it over to Russell for his presentation today. And Russell, I think you might be on mute. We can't hear you yet if you are speaking. Okay, is it working now? It is, we just need you to switch back over to um, the PowerPoint. Yep. Sorry about that. When you started recording, it asked uh, permission. No worries. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the introduction. As our host mentioned, my name is Russell Barabee, and as you can see from the first slide, um, well, I'm sorry. As you can see from this slide, um, I'm part of the Heritage and Wild Trout Program, which is part of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And just wanted to briefly mention that the mission of, our, of that particular program is to protect and enhance California's heritage and wild trout resources while providing opportunities for high quality wild trout angling. And uh, we have an incredible diversity of native trout species in California. Uh, so that's just something I always like to remind people of. Uh, but down here in Southern California, we only have the coastal rainbow that was mentioned earlier. So I'm just going to dive right in. The impacts of invasive species are widespread and deleterious in aquatic systems and the introduction of non-native fishes has contributed to native fish declines throughout the world. Negative impacts from exotic species introductions were cited in 68% of fish extinctions in North America and it is considered the second leading cause of fish extinctions after habitat loss. There was a 1997 survey of fisheries professionals in Western states, and it reported interactions with exotic species as the leading threat to freshwater fauna. And I'm sure anyone listening to this webinar knows that things have only gotten worse in the last 20 years. As far back as 2007, non-native black bullhead were reported in the West Fork of the San Luis Rey River. This is a stream located in Northern San Diego County, and it's known to contain the last population of native coastal rainbow trout in San Diego County. Some later surveys that we did determined the source of this black bullhead as an upstream stock pond, but I wanted to go over the black bullhead briefly and talk about some of the, uh, some stats on this species. Um, for example, this is the most widespread invasive catfish species in California, and it exhibits several life history characteristics which facilitate colonization of areas outside of its native range. For example, high fecundity, 
2,500 to 3,000 eggs per female, parental care of offspring, opportunistic omnivorous feeding habits, and the ability to withstand temperatures as high as 35 degrees Celsius, and the ability to withstand dissolved oxygen levels as low as one to two milligrams per liter. Here is a map from the USGS website illustrating both the native range of the species and locations where it has been introduced. The current distribution of this species has been greatly expanded through intentional introductions and now includes all of the Western states, as you can see. Now, I'm unsure why this species was introduced in many other locations, but I know in Southern California, the primary reason was uh, as a forage species for largemouth bass. So this photo was taken before we started the current project and it shows an area downstream of the study area. And as you can see, it's really just the remnants of a large pool. But on closer inspection, you see this. We ended up having a dip net with us on this particular day and we ended up getting over, 100, over 150 black bullhead out of this one little tiny pocket of water and I'm pretty sure we still didn't get them all. What was interesting is as you approach this pool, you would see all of these bullhead drop down from the surface and hide in the deeper reaches where they couldn't really be seen. But within about 20 seconds, they would all come back to the surface to begin gilling right at that interface to try and make sure they were getting as much oxygen as possible from that, that surface interface. As mentioned earlier, we knew black bullhead were in the system since they were documented as far back as 2007. And there were even attempts at removal by previous CDFW biologists. One such effort, some folks hiked in with electrofishing units and gave that a try, but of all the pools in the system, there's some really deep areas that are in, it's really inefficient to try and electrofish because um, there's so much water and the field spreads out so far, but then there's also a lot of interstitial spaces for the bullhead to hide in, especially during the day. Um, they also tried seining, but that proved ineffective as well because of those same interstitial spaces. So based on the literature and previous efforts, I never really thought I could do anything to make a difference in terms of removing black bullhead from the system. But I wanted to give you guys a little bit of history how I came upon this, the method that we're talking about in this particular presentation. We had an overnight trip planned to go into the West Fork of the San Luis Rey River to collect rainbow trout genetic samples. And I figured since we were going down there, and we had backpacking gear and we had a little bit of room in our packs. Why not throw in a couple of these collapsible minnow traps we had laying around? That night, I went to the 99 cent store and I just grabbed a few random packs of cat food and figured, what the heck, you know, if we can remove 10 black bullhead, then maybe we're going to benefit a few rainbow trout. So we went down that night, collected our rainbow trout uh, genetic samples, and then uh, threw in our traps to set them overnight. We ended up setting eight traps. And the next morning, we had over 30 black bullhead in those traps. And this is what inspired me to attempt a removal effort throughout the whole area of the stream that was occupied by coastal rainbow trout. I mentioned earlier that this stream holds the last known native population of coastal rainbow trout and that they reside in the headwaters of the West Fork San Luis Rey River. They only occupy a short section with intermittent summer flows and multiple perennial pools and 
this native species is the primary reason why I figured if I can do anything to make a difference to benefit these fish, then, then I would do it. Black bullhead have the potential to impact native coastal rainbow trout through predation, competition, or habitat alteration and degradation. Efforts to remove or contain populations of invasive catfish have been mostly ineffective and several published attempts have hypothesized that there's been a compensatory response of the remaining fish as a possible reason for limited success. One particular example is attempts of catfish removal in the Colorado River system. So the study area is located in northern San Diego County on the shoulder of Palomar Mountain. And you can see a couple of small lakes in the upper reaches there. And that is the area. Well, hang on, let me go back. And so Palomar Mountain is part of the peninsular ranges and it has a maximum height of 1,871 meters or just over 6,000 feet. And this area is unique in San Diego County because rainfall averages over 33 inches per year at the top of this mountain, while San Diego itself averages 12 inches per year. This coupled with the high relative humidity supports the dominant vegetative community of a mixed hardwood forest. And I mentioned earlier that this area is really unique and another thing I like to talk about when, when talking about this, there is actually a remnant population of banana slugs on this mountain. And the main reason is because of all that moisture that I talked about. And it's been well studied. They have information going back that says, you know, these, these slugs date back to the Pleistocene when we had a significantly wetter climate going all the way down California. I also wanted to point out in the lower right of the map, you can see Lake Henshaw. And I will talk about that in a little bit. But I wanted to put up a couple of pictures from our surveys to show that this area is incredibly beautiful. Um, but also when I first moved to San Diego, I had no idea places like this actually existed. And since I've been doing this job, I've seen places of the same quality outside of LA as well. Um, and I always like to do this to show people that there really are some spectacular places within Southern California that have uh, many resources that are definitely worth the effort to protect. The photo on the left is of pool one. And I'll show you guys a map in a little bit so you can see exactly where that is. And then the photo on the right is pool 10. And the West Fork of the San Luis Rey River begins as two first order streams on the southern face of Palomar Mountain and flows southeast through the Mendenhall and Barker Valleys before entering Lake Henshaw, which was that lake I mentioned on the lower right of the map. The primary landowner is the Cleveland National Forest and access to the study area is very limited. Here's another photo of an area in the upstream section. And like I said, just like to show. So because of previous monitoring surveys within the West Fork of the San Luis Rey River, we already knew the locations of all of the perennial pools, as well as a few places to camp along the way. The remote nature of the stream required backpacking since it took a minimum of two hours of hiking just to get to where the fish start. So through a grant with Caltrout, we were able to acquire 36 Promar collapsible minnow traps. And we chose these traps because once collapsed, 
each crew member was able to carry 12 as well as all of the other necessary gear for a three day, two night trip. And here you can see Miranda and myself just before heading down to the stream on one of our sampling trips in 2016. And I wanted to put up the exact bait that we used because when I initially submitted the article for publication in North American Journal of Fisheries Management, they specifically asked that we don't put in the specific bait. And I know it can be really important for levels of success, so I wanted to make sure that anybody watching this knew the exact bait that we used. So back to this map. So we designed a sampling plan with two simple objectives. The first was to reduce the population of black bullhead in the West Fork of the San Luis Rey River. And the second was to estimate the initial population size of the black bullhead when we started removal. The ultimate method to estimate the initial population size we settled on was the Leslie method. And we chose that method because it allows for unequal effort in between sampling trips. We chose to focus our efforts in late summer and early fall because this is when water levels are lowest in Southern California streams. And several of our streams at this, in this time frame actually go intermittent. The study area was split into two sections so the crew could cover the whole stream in three days, two nights. A vehicle was staged at the bottom. And so that would be pool one or the lower right of this map here. And the area is actually off of the map where, where we had to stage a vehicle. And then the crew was dropped off at the top, well out of the screen near pool 16 and would hike in. We would begin setting traps around 1500. Traps were baited with approximately 15 pieces of tuna flavored cat treats placed in the deepest portion of the stream, tied to a nearby tree and soaked overnight to maximize opportunity for capture of nocturnal black bullhead. Traps were set throughout the intermittent section of the West Fork in all habitat types where the water was deep enough to cover the trap openings. Pools 16 through eight were set on the first day. We would set traps while heading downstream to our camp, which was located near pool 11. And then at pool 11, we would drop all backpacking gear and set the remaining traps, then hike back to camp hang out at camp for the rest of the, the evening. And then the following morning, traps were removed in the order in which they were set and any captured organisms were identified to species and counted. Invasive species were euthanized on site and any natives were released. The same procedure was used to set traps in pools seven through one. Here's a photo of Miranda setting a trap in pool 15. And you can see how she's holding the string of the trap in one hand. And I wanted to, to put this up to also illustrate that in this system, we at times we tied additional string onto the traps because if you remember pool one, you had these high canyon walls on both sides of the pool. And that made it difficult. We couldn't throw a trap from the, the tail end of the pool all the way to the head. And so by tying about 30 feet of string onto the traps, then we were able to just lower them over the bedrock walls and they would go right into the deepest portion of that pool. It also allowed us to throw the traps 
in some of the really wider, shallow, shallower pools that were in the, the lower section. So on to results, a total of four removal efforts occurred in 2016, and it resulted in the capture of 1,315 black bullhead. And then we also caught 18 coastal rainbow trout, nine adult American bullfrogs, and 319 American bullfrog tadpoles. The number of minnow traps set per trip varied due to difficulty in establishing a removal protocol and also variation in field personnel availability. Particularly, you can see on trip two, only 48 nets were set and a person who had committed to coming with us on that trip never showed up. And so it ended up just being two of us. As you can see, catch decreased rapidly from trips one through four. And this was wonderful. After, after trip one and catching so many, I was really surprised. And to see the numbers decline so rapidly into trip two was, I was just ecstatic in the field. CPUE or catch per unit effort decreased rapidly as well. And I wanted to point out that we calculated CPUE with each trap considered as a unit of effort. And you can also see our confidence intervals got significantly tighter uh, with each successive trip as well. As noted earlier, traps were set in all habitat types where the water was deep enough to cover the trap openings. And you can see from this map with the dot showing each location where we set a trap that there was not an equal distribution throughout the system. As I noted earlier, sampling occurred in late summer, early fall, when Southern California streams have their lowest flows. And many sections in the study area were dry or had subsurface flows. Another thing you can note on this map is all of the blue dots, which show locations where we set a trap, but we didn't capture any black bullhead. And then the last thing I wanted to point out on this map that I think is pretty important is that 86% of all the black bullhead we captured were caught in the 16 perennial pools. This is not surprising when we consider this is a high gradient headwater stream where much of the habitat that is available is not suitable for black bullhead. But I still think it's something that's really worth pointing out. Here you can see one of the many sections of the West Fork San Luis Rey River where surface water is present but flows were too low to allow us to set any traps. We also tried to be flexible in that if we were going, we were hiking downstream and we saw anywhere that had a, a bullhead in it, we definitely made sure to set a trap. But as noted earlier, this didn't happen very often because the species tends to be more, more nocturnal. So here is a breakdown of catch within each pool. You can see that a significant portion of the catch came from pools two, three, and four. And I wanted to point this out because these are the pools that are lower in the system and they tended to be large, wide pools that had a lot of soft substrata in their margins and in the tails, which is an ideal habitat 
for Black Bullhead. Also wanted to show on this and point out that pools one and seven were the only two pools that showed an increase in catch from trip one to trip two. And then the last thing that I thought was really interesting on this particular plot is that we were able to push catch to zero, excuse me, we were able to push catch to zero in 69% of all the pools or 11 out of 16. And um, that was also something that was really wonderful to see these huge catches on those first three trips, especially in pools two, three, and four, and then be able to drive those catches all the way to zero. So capturing 1,315 black bullhead, by doing that, we achieved object objective one, which was reducing the population of black bullhead. As I mentioned earlier, to achieve objective two of estimating the population, the initial population size of black bullhead, uh, we used the Leslie method. And so we regressed catch per unit effort against cumulative catch, and we were able to estimate the initial population size of black bullhead as 1,360. This was wonderful when I saw this number, because as you remember, we removed 1,315 and being so close to the number removed and estimating the initial size really made us believe that we had made a big difference in this water. So baited minnow traps set overnight proved extremely effective in capturing black bullhead from a small headwater stream in Southern California. However, we believe environmental factors assisted us in these removal efforts. From 2012 through 2016, California experienced one of the worst droughts in over a century of instrumental observations. Reduced rainfall led to lower water levels and increased the proportion of low flowing habitats with soft substrata, which is the preferred habitat of black bullhead. And we think this coupled with the bullhead being forced into those pools that were the only remaining water facilitated our removal by concentrating the target species. In 2017, 2018, and 2019, we also resampled all of the pools using these same methods that we've outlined so far. And not a single black bullhead was captured. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that in 2016 when we snorkeled all of the available habitat in order to monitor the rainbow trout population we observed a total of 33 black bullhead with no more than four observed in any one pool as you can see here yet the average number of black bullhead removed from each pool was 71 with a range of 0 to 255 considering the nocturnal feeding habitats of black bullhead, these results are not surprising, but the low numbers of these invasive fish that were seen in snorkel surveys that were done during the day really made me realize that, you know, low numbers of these invasive fish could go undetected with daytime snorkel surveys. And these methods could be used to determine a basic or a baseline level of bullhead presence in a stream where they're not supposed to be. And I thought that that could be pretty important. Um, and it also would allow someone to determine the, the level of infestation without the use of something like a dangerous nighttime snorkel survey, 
Um, and I don't know about any of you guys, but the few times that I've done nighttime snorkeling, I did not have a good time. I thought it was really cold and uh, I guess I should have had a dry suit. I also wanted to point out some potential advantages of these traps. Um, first would be low cost, less than $30 per trap. So in the world of fisheries, that's a pretty cheap piece of sampling gear. The collapsible nature of these traps allows for easy transport um, and really easy storage. And it also allows for use like in this project where you could take them into the back country where quite often getting sampling gear into can be incredibly difficult. These traps have a really easy setup, bait and deploy. You know, you're talking minimal training here. And then they're also not dangerous like chemicals or electrofishing and minimal safety gear. You know, in this situation, we typically wear snake gaiters here because we see a lot of rattlesnakes out. But aside from our basic normal boots that we use and that, there is no additional safety gear. And these traps are also really low maintenance, but only if fish are captured. Uh, we captured one western pond turtle on our surveys and that pond turtle did not destroy our trap. But if you have sliders or any snapping turtles present, it's most likely they will destroy these traps. Then this is a picture of the upstream source of black bullhead. And I wanted to talk about efforts to address the upstream source. And so we used this, we employed the same techniques on this pond in 2016, 2017, and 2018. And we removed 74, 256, and 215 black bullhead, respectively. We were never able to trap this pond more than once in a field season and that was because of access from the private landowner restricted it. Unfortunately, we have not been able to get back onto this private property in, uh, in 2019 or 2020. And so without a doubt, I know that there are still black bullhead in here and when the stream connects again and, and there's always the potential that fish could be washed back down into the area where the rainbow trout reside. It's unfortunate, but that's part of dealing with private landowners. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unsure what else we can do without access. And so with that, uh, I just wanted to show a picture of a couple of volunteers and um, you can also see, you know, we put out a lot of traps in that upstream pond and still only captured 256 at the most. And then as anyone who's watching this knows, you cannot do this work alone. And so I definitely wanted to acknowledge uh, some other people who helped really make this possible. Um, as I mentioned, Cal Trout helped with the grant to get bait as well as traps. Forest Service personnel helped with us actually going out and doing the field work and setting traps, as well as several people from CDFW helped with uh, setting the traps as well as data analysis. And with that, uh, I have a question slide, but I know that uh, that Alex and Matt wanted this slide up. And so, thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation and a lot of uh, really helpful uh, project details that I think folks here will really benefit from hearing from. 
Uh, so as Matt just wrote in the chat box, um, feel free to just enter your question directly in there. Um, if you'd also like to ask Russell a question, you can um, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, or turn your video camera on and we can have a bit of a discussion. So we have a few minutes to get into some questions and there have been a few. They're slowly coming in. Um, first question is actually for Matt. So uh, Russell, you mentioned um, that you, uh, you know, released some native species from the traps, including Western pond turtles. Are there any other key species in the stream um, that you'd expect to benefit from bullhead removal? So downstream, there is uh, the furthest southern, the southernmost population of Arroyo Chub, which is a species that's native to seven watersheds in ranging from San Diego all the way up into Ventura County. And I did not go and use, employ these methods in those particular, in that particular location. But I think that removing them from the upstream section certainly prevents when the stream connects in wintertime, um, additional individuals washing down into those, those uh, pools. Great, yeah, thank you for uh, clarifying that. Um, our next question is from Dina. So Dina asked, um, did you observe any bullhead size decreases with each trapping trip? I didn't really observe a decrease in size. Um, actually, we didn't measure the bullhead, but I noticed that we tended to catch most of the juveniles on the earlier trips. I mentioned in pools two, three, and four that we, we had a lot of fish caught in those. And in one particular trip, we caught over, I think it was over 250 in one pool. And I'd say 90% of those were the juveniles. And not really surprising because the life history uh, characteristics of bullhead, the juveniles tend to congregate in a school and they tend to feed in the crepuscular periods. And so once one of them finds the trap and thinks they have food, then I think they all just go right in. And then that I think also really makes it a lot easier. And I think it um, would definitely mess with any decrease in size. Yeah, thanks for your question, Dina. Um, so let's see, uh, a couple more questions coming in. So um, Ross, I had a question for you too. Um, did you observe any you know, changes in the native coastal rainbow trout populations um, since conducting the, these removal trips? So the snorkel surveys the following year, we saw a huge increase in the number of rainbow trout in the system. I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think um, in 2016, before removal, I think we counted 141. And then in 2017, we saw over 400. Uh, but that, we don't believe that is all attributable to black bullhead removal because the drought I mentioned and then we also had a high flow event where over seven inches of rain fell in a 24 hour period. And a lot of the published literature says that during periods of drought, fine particulate organic material can build up within the stream and likely clog up those spawning beds that rainbow trout would use. And so you get that high flow event and it creates some new gravels and it moves them around and it cleans them out really nicely. And so we think that that ultimately benefited the trout probably more than just bullhead removal, but I think that we could take a little bit of credit. So we have a, um, another question, uh, if you feel comfortable um, 
Russell commenting on this too, but for a project like this that spanned, you know, multiple years and, you know, it seems like there's kind of a, an ongoing component and, if, you know, kind of next steps to try to continue uh, uh, monitoring for bullhead. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, you know, long-term funding and, and finding, you know, support to be able to continue, you know, removing uh, a species that could be problematic, you know, in the future too. And then a second part to that question, um, you know, do you have any strategies in terms of working with a private landowner to gain access, um, you know, and how you might kind of go about that in the future? So the first part is something I think we all face in, in any wildlife field with invasive species. And it's something that I think managers are asking those questions of, do we, is this something that we want to do? I have a coworker who does um, flathead catfish removal from one of the lakes here in Southern California. And he calls it mowing the lawn because he knows that the work that he's doing is not going to remove the species and it's not going to, it's likely going to benefit the largemouth bass fishery, but it's not going to truly make a difference and he's going to have to do it every year over and over and over. Um, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure to get this information out was that I thought with our system and what we were able to accomplish, it was fairly unique, especially when I dove into the literature and you see that not a lot of invasive fish removals have been successful. And that's part of what makes it so difficult to be denied access from the landowner at the top because you know, I think we could get them out of that pond, but I can't do it without access. And as far as strategies to access the property, uh, what's interesting is when I first heard about the pond, I contacted the landowner. He allowed me to go on his property, and then we just ran a few sayings, and we were able to capture the bullhead and, and figure out that that was the source. And... And then I asked him directly about removal. And he said, well, first of all, I didn't know there was fish in there. Second of all, why would I want to remove them? And I tried to explain to him that they were impacting a native species downstream and I didn't get any traction with them. A couple, probably a couple years had passed. And then, um, so that was probably, I'm guessing maybe 2013, 2014. And then, I began to work closely with Dr. Sandra Jacobson from Caltrout and I asked her if she could contact him and see if he would grant us access. And through, and what I was hoping is because she was a nonprofit and perhaps a little better at persuading him to gain us access that you know, maybe he was just, didn't want government people on his plan. And, and ultimately it worked. And I think part of the reason it worked is because she's a nonprofit, but I think another part of the reason worked is because of who she is and that she's really good at what she does. And so, you know, trying to capitalize on the people who you work with and, and knowing their skills, I think is also a great way to help gain access to those private properties because you know, I know I can come off a little brash at times and, and perhaps that would be something that, you know, I was just asking too directly when instead Sandra was able to go in there and say, well, here's the reasons, um, you know, and, and here's why this is important. And, and she was able to get the point across in a better way than I was. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Those, uh, you know, collaborative details are, are really important to hear, too. Um, so for folks uh, still on the webinar, um, we'll give everyone another minute or two to see if anyone has a last question. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll get going here.
So uh, one more minute, any last questions? Feel free to speak up too if you wanna um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, Matt's gonna put some links in the chat box to CCAST as well as the case study that you heard about today. And if there are no more questions, um, I'll turn it over to Matt. Sure, thanks, Alex. And actually, uh, there's one question that came to me as well. Um, so I'll relay, relay that to you, Russell. And the question is, is there a possibility of installing a barrier below the pond? And I'm assuming that's referring to the, the upstream pond, that's the source. So what's interesting is there is a barrier. Um, so, you have that upstream pond and then it flows through the meadow and, and they graze that meadow and then there's another pond that goes dry and then down near their ranch house there's another area where the barrier is and two streams come together right there and then I don't know how many years ago they did this but it looks like it's 1950s construction there is a basically a dam and it's about four feet tall and so it takes a really good rain event in order to overtop this thing and that actually happened in 2017 in that that one particular rainstorm i mentioned and so my assumption is and, and it, it goes over and when it you know since it's been overflowing for many years there's like a 14 foot drop on that other side before you even hit water. And then I think it's scoured out probably about five feet deep. And so because these fish tend to stay on the bottom, I think what tends to wash downstream is going to be your juveniles. And um, and those ones, you know, obviously if we end up with one or two, it's not a big deal. They have a hard time finding each other but putting a screen or anything over to prevent things from washing down would be incredibly problematic because the when the water gets that high there's going to be all of the the debris associated with it and then it's just anyone who's ever tried to deal with screening and that sort of stuff knows it's it's really problematic especially during high flows so i think that wall is ultimately benefited me but with no removal efforts up top in the last two years, I think the potential for a lot of baby bullhead is definitely going to come back to get me. Indeed. Thanks, Russell. Thanks, Russell. Thank you. All right, and I last check here, I don't believe I've seen any new questions. Um, and Alex, if you haven't received any, I'll go ahead and jump in. Okay, so with that, um, you know, work on closing us out here. Um, wanna thank everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, as you know, this webinar was recorded and we'll make it available on the CCAST YouTube channel. Um, if you missed the previous webinars, those recordings have also been posted on the CCAST YouTube channel. Um, I put a link to, uh, to that YouTube channel in the, in the chat box, but you can also find it just by Googling uh, CCAST YouTube. Of course, you are also invited to join us on CCAST where we have a case study on the work that uh, Russell presented today. Uh, that URL, I also inserted in the, um, it, it's on this slide and I also inserted it in the chat box. And you can also find a link to the main CCAST uh, website. Um, also of note, if, uh, you haven't visited the CCAST website, or if you have before, uh, that has recently been revamped with a bunch of new content, so it's worth checking out at some point as well. We'll be announcing the December webinar shortly on our listservs. Um, please contact me or Alex if you want to make sure you receive that webinar announcement, but you're not yet on our mailing list. You can also contact us if you're interested in joining the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice, um, or would like more information about that. We thank everyone for your time. Thank you, Russell, really for the great presentation and especially some of the specific details I think will be really useful as Alex said, uh, really great stuff. 
So thank you all, and we hope you have a great Thursday. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, everyone, for joining today.